A quick demo on what I ended up doing to get to this high quality mesh of the ice cream getting um, spit out of your machine. I had to change a few things and basically what I ended up doing was modifying some attributes on the actual solve as well as using OpenVDB to do the meshing. So the built-in Bifrost mesher is great for doing things like liquid with lots of splashes and droplets and things like that, but it was never gonna get us to a result that I thought looked good enough. Um, so I jumped out and started using OpenVDB, which is a very common set of tools that are inside of Maya via a plugin. They're in Houdini, they're in Nuke, they're in Clarice, or in basically any application that, that's working with a voxelized workflow. Um, has the ability to do OpenVDB, and it's it's actually a very, very powerful uh, set of tools. So I'll walk you through that also at the end of the presentation here. So first and foremost, I had to change a few things on the solve. When you're trying to extract a mesh from a solve, you have to have a high quality solve underneath it or else you're never gonna get to a good result. And the file that you originally sent over here, which is Rockstar file, um, had a master voxel size of 005. And as you start to scrub through this guy, you'll see that there's some pretty uh, pretty nasty things. So there's these, these holes in it that kind of happen from the stepping, as well as the fact that it's got this very, um, you know, kind of spiky look to it, this kind of segmented look to it. And the reason it has that segmented look to it is there's not enough samples happening to capture that movement smoothly. So each one of those little spikes is basically happening at the frame. So the first thing I tried was to increase the number of transport samples. So I, the transport adaptivity value I pushed up to one, which is going to make it use the most highest number of transport samples. And the transport samples are basically what's happening when the particles and the voxels are infecting their information onto each other or transporting their information onto each other. So it's the last part of the sim. And it does a, it does a decent job of, of you know, capturing more detail but the problem is that it doesn't get rid of the substep. So you can see here with that transport value set to one, we're no longer getting that kind of caved in shape on the U here, but it still has all that weird spiky, spiky stuff happening. So the next one over to the right, which says time step 510 master voxel size 0.05. This is based at the same resolution as your simulation, but what I've done is I've changed the time steps to be between five and 10. So it's adaptively setting that number between five and 10. The defaults are one and two. So this is basically changing the number of samples for the whole calculation, not just that last transport phase. It's changing it for the whole sim. And that basically means it, for each frame, it's going to be simulate, it's going to sub simulate that five to 10 times between each frame. So you get a much smoother um, interpolation between those frames. It's not just this kind of weird steppy spiky thing happening. It starts to capture the arc of the movement. The one to the right one more time, this guy right here is the same um, time steps, but this time I've made the master voxel size 0 0.0025, so it's it's half the size of the resolution, which means it's going to have a lot more polys. You can see as this guy's meshed at 52,000 verts, this guy meshes out at 21,000 verts, and those are with the same exact meshing attributes. So it captures a lot more detail. There's a lot more information in there that the mesher can extract. So the next one over to the right is using the same mesh or the same simmed data, the same Bifrost simmed data as far as the, uh, the, the size goes, so it's uh, time steps of five and 10, master voxel size of 0.025, but instead of using the Bifrost measure, which this guy used, I'm using the open VDB measure and a bunch of smoothing um, filters to get to this end result, which I think looks really, really tight. So even though it's nice and smoothed out here, it still isn't caving in on top of itself as we're doing that smoothing. So we're keeping that edge still nice and independent. Now keep in mind that when these guys intersect each other, when a voxel passes through a voxel, it's going to have to seal that off. But the way I have it set right now, the transition between the you know frame 28 and 29, I think looks really, really tight. And even that little divot that was right there on that end, you know, this I think is gonna look a lot like ice cream once you go ahead and you render this guy out. And it's keeping that nice crisp edge and that, you know, that really sharp little V sort of right in that area, right in that range. And that's just, uh, that's really cool that the, the mesher has the ability to do that. And then obviously, as you kind of scrub through this sim, when it doubles back on top of itself, you know, it does a really good job of sort of preserving the independent um, nature of, of each one of these little little spikes here. You can see as these guys sort of kind of come back on top of each other here, it's still got that nice hollow 
preserved right there. Whereas this mesh, you know, that's this is the same. This is using basically the same underlying SEM data, the one here and the one here. Um, this mesher is just doing a much better job than the standard Maya mesher, and you can even see that we start to get those little little spikes kind of popping up here. Um, that's showing that that subsample. So you could increase the samples on this guy, and you could decrease the master voxel size to get it looking even better. Um, if you wanted to. Now, obviously that's going to come at the cost of simulation. And these guys were simming out pretty quickly, a couple hours to do the sim at five and 10 at 0.0025, which isn't bad. Like a couple hours for a sim is, is nothing. When we were doing the sims for the hyperspace madness ocean, as well as the spaceship collision, they were, they were several days to do a sim. So, you know, the iteration process was, was a bit painful. Um, but anyway, that's basically it as far as getting your parameters set up right in the solver and then ending up with this really nice, um, you know, voxelized open VDB version. So let me walk you through the process of working with open VDB inside of Maya. So um, it's pretty straightforward to download and install. I'll, I'll include the link in the email on, on where to get it. It's just an open source, you know, file structure. Um, everyone uses it. And what we've got here is just the particles loaded up. So this has been cached out. You can see that particle cache is loaded up and we're looking at frame 28 and we wanna begin meshing this. So we're gonna mesh it using OpenVBD and I've got that kind of loaded up here on my shelf. So the first thing you wanna do is just go ahead and bring up your node editor. And in your node editor, we're going to start to create a couple of nodes. So if you just click on this guy and you can see that it's it's just a giant suite of tools for dealing with um, voxel voxels or or converting things to voxels. Polygons can get converted to voxels. Um, particles can get converted to voxels. So it's it's awesome tools, and it even does things like booleans. I mean, it's what you can do with this is is it's crazy crazy cool. Um, there's lots of videos out there on it, so you can you can you know <laughs> dive into them all day long if you want to. I'm just going to show you the workflow that I use to get to that end result here. So the first thing we're going to do is go ahead and do Bifrost to Array, bring in that node. So this is going to look at um, a Bifrost node in your scene. If we bring up the attributes for this guy, I'm actually called Bifrost Liquid 1, not Bifrost Liquid Shape. So I need to put a one at the end of that guy. So we'll just go ahead and we'll do that. And then the next one that we wanna get is, so that that's basically querying the information inside of your scene off of this Bifrost Shape node, which is this, this, this guy essentially, same, same thing. So then the next one that we're gonna get is, that turns it into a particle point. So this is basically taking the Bifrost stuff and making an array of particle points. So the next one we wanna grab is um, VBD from particles. So we wanna basically generate a vector a voxel database from the particles. So make sure that you set this to voxelized point first and put that down to 0 0.0025, which is the size of your voxelized shape. Um, and if I do want to switch it to uh, particles, I can put that to 0 0.025 first. If you don't drop these down before you hook it up, it'll it'll basically it'll it'll panic and choke your system. So what we want to do is we want to grab the out position of those uh, particle points and go to the end put point input on this guy. So you do that, and it's been wired up. So now the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start to figure out how to uh, to visualize this. So you could keep going down to this list and you know, grabbing the nodes from there. Or you could just hit the tab key and write um, you know, VDB and I wanna get the visualizer. So if I just type um, VDBV, it brings up a list of that. So I've now got a node that will allow me to visualize this. This is like the turning on the voxel view inside of the, the liquid shape node. Same, same basic thing. So we'll take the out of that into the input of this guy and with a few seconds here, we're gonna switch this over to show surface. And it'll take just a second to, uh, to grab this guy. And oh, if it doesn't show up right away, you have to give it a kick. You have to go back to frame zero. It's a, it's a, little, it's a little funky that way. Um, so when you go back to frame zero, you can see now my voxelized space has showed up inside of there. So now if we just jump back up to frame 28, we can get to uh, something that's meshed out for this guy. So. Pretty cool, there's our raw data. So basically now you have to start filtering it. And this is, the internal mesher does this also. Like when you're playing with the um, the kernel factor and the smoothing and all those attributes on the actual liquid shape node, like if you jump in here to this liquid shape node and you look at the mesher, ultimately this is, this is doing a form of 
filtering, you know, the surface radius, the kernel factor, the smoothing, a resolution factor. That's all doing, um, you know, similar things that we're going to be doing just more in a kind of node-based procedural workflow to start to filter out this raw data to get to that end result that, you know, kind of smooths this guy out because it looks it looks a little, a little funky right now, right? So we'll take that visualizer and I'm just going to turn off all this stuff. I don't need to see all that. I just want to see the mesh. So this is really pretty straightforward. The first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to add into our chain here a filter. So if I just hit the tab key and start typing filter and you can see there's, there's a few um, VDB filters. So we're just going to grab this one right here and we'll take the output of that guy into the input of this guy. Pretty straightforward. And then we can hit two on this guy and just kind of pipe that guy into there. So now we filtered this guy out and there's a couple different types of filters that you can use. And these are going to do, you know, they're going to give you different, different looks or different things. So I'm going to go to the, to the median one and we'll just crank this range up a little bit, something like that. We'll give it a couple iterations. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump back to my particle extractor here and I'm going to start to, to change a few of the attributes on this guy. So I'm going to put my voxel size down to actually 0.1 and you're going to see that it's going to go through and it's it's going to revoxelize that guy and I might get little holes and things like that and that's okay because we can basically use some of these other attributes to start to fill that in. It actually didn't make any holes so that's pretty good. So now that's starting to look pretty cool so I can go up here and I can give this a little bit of smoothing, something like two and if I wanted to I can start to increase this um, half band voxels and that'll get rid of that little sub step in there. So by playing around with the smoothing and these half band voxels, I can start to really kind of crank this guy out. So if I put that up to something like five, it's going to um, further refine this or, or smooth that guy out a, a little bit more. And that's basically what I did to get to the uh, to the end result. I, I kind of played around with those guys and, and honestly just sort of dialed these in. And I think I actually even saved a preset for this one. So if we just click on that guy, it's going to take a second to re... Oh, my caps lock is still on. It's horrible. Definitely don't want caps locks turned on. Yeah, so that looks that looks pretty cool. So there's a couple other things that you can add in here that are kind of cool. You know, some other filtering things that you can add in. Um, one of the ones that I added in was I just did an offset. So if I did a filter here and I think for the one that I did, I did a SDF filter and I set this guy to do a median with a couple iterations on that. And I put that in front of this guy. So I took the output of this into the input of that guy and then if you just do a two on this guy and a two on this guy and you grab the out of this dude into that guy that's going to give another layer of filtering and you can really stack these on top of each other as much as you want like you can you can filter on top of filter on top of filter and then ultimately what i ended up doing was i gave it a little bit of offset so i i kind of scaled the mesh down a tad bit with another filter so if i just do filter um on this dude and grab this guy and we'll just grab the out of him into the input of this guy and then we'll go from that to that and on this one what I did is uh, you can see just you know stacking that extra mean on top of there look look at the look at the difference of this guy so see that where it's 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 not it's not really showing them it's it's not caving on itself as soon as you you know jump and take that node out of the mix, you can see that it caves in on itself. So just by adding that second layer of filtering on top of that guy, um, it looks it looks really really cool. So you can use all of this to um, you know to basically get you to where you want to be. So then if it's time to make a mesh, the final thing that you need to do is just go up here and create a um, what one is it? It's convert. So just grab a converter. So the converter is going to allow us to take the output of this. So if you hit two on this guy and grab the output and pump that into the converter's input, and we're going to convert um, two polygons. So it's going to go through and generate a mesh um, as soon as you tag it into this. So we need to get a mesh for this to get shoved into. So if you just hit the tab key and start typing mesh, it'll just create a poly shape. And you can now grab the output mesh of this guy and put it into the in mesh. And just like that, we've now got, I can hide this guy. We don't need to see its surface here. We've now got the surface in our scene. So if I right mouse click on top of this guy and assign a material to it, pretty awesome. And that just needs its normals inverted. So just go back to that convert mesh and 
Now we've got a mesh that we can select and export out via an Alembic cache. So really a very simple workflow and obviously the ability to you know, dial in the amount of smoothing and extract the information, you can, you can really, um, you can go crazy with it and get exactly what you want. But that does a great job of capturing um, the overall look and feel while not, you know, fusing together um, as quickly as the default um, Bifrost Mesher does. So hopefully that makes sense to you. If you, um, if you have any other questions, just, uh, you know, hit me up. Don't be shy. Cheers, Dan.